This is going to be a special UCLA Brain Sport podcast episode. I have on Dr. George Slavich. He's the director of the UCLA Stress Lab. So our topic today is going to be how adverse childhood experiences and stress contribute to chronic inflammation and then how that chronic inflammation can then contribute to adverse overall health and brain health outcomes. We also talk about the idea of resiliency and the idea of belonging. Why is that so special? I really enjoyed this one. I hope you guys do too. But most importantly, stay safe, be well. You've taken the three, in my, my biased opinion, the three most interesting fields, formed it into one, and made it your life's work to do some of the most interesting research that I've come across. Neuro, no, psycho neuroimmunology. You got it. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> and, um, you are the director of the UCLA Stress Lab. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, what you're doing, it's you're researching stress, how that contributes to inflammation, and then what that results in in terms of um, human health. And I'm particularly interested in it because you're trying to find out how it contributes to brain health and potentially maybe some brain injury um, and also mental health, but you know, I think mental health and brain health are pretty synonymous. So it sounds like you took my job. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'll head out and the rest of the podcast is yours. No, you're, you're, uh, dressed, you're dressed for your role. I'm not <laughs> dressed for your role at all. Um, yeah, psychoneuroimmunology. I mean, listen, it's a, it's a fancy word that combines psychology, neuroscience, and immunology. And um, I don't know, that sounds kind of extravagant until you live it and then it's not so groundbreaking. For example, the last time uh, when you got the flu, and uh, I mean, we've all been sick, what happens? Like, you don't feel like getting out of bed, You're, you have aches and pains in your body, and uh, you, you kinda wanna avoid other people, right? Right. I mean, that's it in a nutshell, right? It's, the, it's, it's uh, the connection between the immune system, our brain, and how we think and feel about the world. Yeah. So, um, Studying it, which I'm sure we'll get into, is a little bit complicated, but I think we all live psychoneuroimmunology every day, and, uh, uh, and anything that you feel when you're sick or when your immune system's changing is something that's subject to being able to be studied and understood. Yeah, and I was telling you earlier um, what I've come to realize the last couple of years being at this program, and something that, like, when I read a lot of your publications and a lot of stuff that you're doing was like so eye-opening to me is, you know, I used to, th I think medicine, you know, several years ago was, you know, you have the mind over here and then, you know, you have the brain over here and, you know, they're completely separate entities that, you know, need to be addressed and treated separately. Um, but a big eye-opening thing for me is that there's significant overlap between the two, so much so that, you know, they might be, pretty much the same thing. What do you think? That sounds like a good cliffhanger. And now we like <laughs> cut to commercial and come back. We don't have commercials, thank God. There you go. Um, uh, we've got to get you some commercials. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Soon, hopefully. Um, if we get some sponsors, maybe we can have some commercials. There but, you go. All right, sponsors out there. All right. Some sponsors. <laughs> maybe some UCLA health commercials. Why not? Or a UCLA stress lab commercial. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Uh, listen, the... Um, uh, this disconnection between the brain and the body that's been going on for a long time that still persists, uh, especially in, dare I say, medical education, you know, where uh, we did an analysis of the top, uh, the, the uh, curricula for the top 50 primary care focused medical schools, and guess what? Uh, you know, less than 10% of them have keywords in the course descriptions that focus on biobehavioral integration, certainly not psychoneuroimmunology that's never mentioned, but anything that involves integration of the, of the mind, um, the brain, and the body. So I, I don't think we can be too surprised that um, lay people and doctors alike are still making that distinction of this clear cut between where the, where the brain stops and the body begins, or the, where the periphery begins, I should say, uh, because that's what we're all taught. Right. Um, and there's a cool story from seven years ago about one small chip in that, um, in that sort of uh, dualistic thinking, which is um, a postdoc at the University of Virginia was looking through a microscope 
and saw a structure that runs along the brainstem that was previously not known to exist. And those are meningeal vessels. Mm -hmm. I like to call them the cytokine superhighway. Yeah. Uh, long story short, any neuroinflammatory event that's going on in your, obviously in your central nervous system, can affect the periphery by trafficking or by hopping on this cytokine, what I call cytokine superhighway, and go to the periphery of the body. Yeah. Um, and, but what I mean to say is that that's, what the, that's where this distinction, um, that's what people had to grapple with. If something was happening in the brain, physically, how could it affect the periphery of the body? Because we have this idea of the blood-brain barrier, nothing can cross it. Of course, that's also not exactly true. But people couldn't figure out how it was that neuro, for example, neuroinflammatory events would affect the periphery. Right. Because we didn't have the structural information about the body to make those interactions possible, but we do now. Yeah, and vice versa, right? And how, vice how versa. systemic things and like systemic inflammation can actually influence uh, uh, the state of the brain as well as um, brain inflammation and, and even behavior. Again, and I think of us living psychoneuroimmunology. So when you eat crappy food, you're not like ready to go up and get them, right? right? You feel a little kind of dragged out and slower well, your brain is in charge of that sort of motivational component, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, but you're, you know, the food you eat is not going into your head, it's going into your stomach. Right. So that's what I mean by living psychoneuroimmunology. You know, on a on a day-to-day -day basis, we feel these interactions between our psychology, our uh, neurology, and our uh, immune system. We just need to take those brain-body interactions and, and study them. And that's what we're doing. Yeah. And I feel this, com I hope this conversation provides a lot of insight to not only physicians out there that might be watching this, but then also just people, right? Like people that eat fast 100%. food and feel crappy afterwards, right? Um, sort of this underlying reason why that is. And then, you know, hopefully that can get them to maybe change some behavior. Let's see if we can change one person's behavior. Let's do it. So I think a good place to start is to talk about sort of the underlying biological basis for, um, you know, how stress can lead to um, inflammation. Great. Yeah, let's start there. Yeah, I, I hope some of your listeners will already be, uh, their interest would be piqued in that concept because I have to say, I'm, maybe I'm the only one, uh, but I get stressed out every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, when I'm stressed out, I notice that my mood is changing. It goes from okay to upset. My, my thoughts are maybe changing. You know, I'm like totally even keel and I'm thinking about the worst happening or something like that. But I have to say, I never really thought about my immune system changing on a moment to moment basis based on what I'm experiencing in the world. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I can, I could, you know, if I get sick, I understand my immune system's changing because I feel very different. Right. But I never would have thought, for example, that, you know, if you're stressed out for five or 10 minutes, that all of a sudden you're going to ramp up systemic inflammation, have this acute phase response, and all of a sudden your immune system's in a different state. Right. Well, we've done a ton of studies, uh, and, you know, the long and the short of it is that if you're stressed out for five to 10 minutes, for example, you're brought into the lab and you're made to thought that you're being evaluated or you're on a video camera and you're asked to give a speech about right. why you would be a good job candidate. Um, very quickly, uh, Im um, immune response genes come online, start to uh, lead to gene expression that promotes these pro-inflammatory proteins throughout the body. And all of a sudden, your periphery of your body is changing from a relatively non-inflammatory state to an inflammatory state. And wow, that just got me thinking, you know what I mean? How many times during the day or during the week am I stressed out for 10 minutes? Right. And am I becoming inflamed every time that happens? Now, we'll also talk about, you know, the resilience component of it, but that for me was like eye-opening. Yeah. You know, that if you bring somebody into the laboratory, you stress them out with a social stressor, mm -hmm. you just make them believe that they're being ev socially evaluated, 10 minutes, huge increases in inflammation. Yeah. So um, I want to talk about the exact systems that cause stress to then translate into inflammation. And I have a slide here. Great. If you want Let's to throw it up. it up. Yeah. So okay, I stressed so, it out a little bit. You so we, start, we started simple, huh? Yeah. So we start at the top. You know, it's in this model, because we're talking about stress, it's all about your perceptions of the social environment. Right. And we just have to make a distinction between what the social environment actually is and also your appraisal of it. Mm -hmm. So that's important. So, 
you know, you can be, you can have a great social circumstances, you have a great wife, great husband, kids love you, everything, but you don't feel connected. Yeah. And so that's a distinction between the actual characteristics of the environment and how you're appraising. Now, the, the brain is the key linchpin in the appraisal process, right? right. It's in right. charge of a lot of all top-down control of your body, but it's also in charge of appraising the social environment. So we start to think about higher order brain regions like the amygdala, which is involved in threat perception, perception mm -hmm. fear, um, dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, uh, anterior insula, all of which are coordinating uh, to appraise the social environment, to detect changes from things being kind of friendly to being threatening, and then to send those signals to lower brainstem regions that then govern these systems you're showing here. Right. So we have a couple of systems that you know your listeners will be well familiar with, the sympathetic nervous system, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access, the um, afferent and efferent vagus nerve, and then this one in the blue, which, which I mentioned earlier, the meningeal lymphatic vessels. As a function of those systems um, that I show there, any neuroinflammatory event or, let's say, thought that gets converted into some kind of neurological signal can essentially affect uh, all cells throughout the body and organs through the vagus nerve. Um, but what I'm depicting uh, here are um, this cartoonish example of, a, of an immune cell. So the thing to know is that the end products of each of these axes can interact with receptors on immune cells. Mm -hmm. So that means that, hypothetically, what you're thinking in your brain, if it gets converted into changes in sympathetic nervous system activity, HPA axis activity, or changes in vagus nerve activity, can affect immune cell function and therefore any behaviors that are associated with changes in the immune system could result from experiences of stress. So end products of, of the SNS are norepinephrine and epinephrine, main end product, the HPA access, cortisol, um, and, uh, and your immune cells have receptors for epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol. When they detect those changes, you have these huge um, uh, activation of intracellular transcription factors, which can translocate some kind of threat signal, like an experience of social evaluation or social rejection or social exclusion, can, can translocate that signal uh, from the, uh, uh, into the nucleus of the cell, where then it can lead to gene expression. So depending on which genes are expressed, for example, this, what I'm showing here is like the interleukin-1 beta, the IL-6, and the tumor necrosis factor alpha genes. If you have binding at those sites, you can with the transcription factors, you can lead to the expression of those genes that then code for those proteins. And yeah. those proteins show there, IL-1 beta, IL-6, uh, IL excuse me, and TNF-alpha are all key drivers of systemic, um, the, the systemic inflammatory response. Right. And then down at the bottom there, there's benefits to these responses in the short term, right? Um, when you think about you know, uh, the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, like a lion's chasing you or something like that, right? Um, you have, it says there, a, height, a heightened threat and pain sensitivity, avoidance of physical danger, enhanced wound healing, yep. right? Which, yep. to which totally makes sense, right? You're activating your immune system right. in preparation of possibly being injured. 100%. Right? Um, and then you have improved physical recovery, but these are all things uh, in the short term and that indicate a greater likelihood of survival, right? Right. But in the long term, you know, they can lead, in the long term or if they're happening all the time or chronically, which basically means like happening all the time, um, it can lead to other things, right? As, as I said, you're going to take my job. So <laughs> this- I'm just, I'm just reading. Yeah, well, I'm, no, you're- I'm, re I'm literally just you're reading your reader. paper. <laughs> so listen, the, you know, this whole, this whole, um, uh, this whole thinking about you know, these dichotomies, right? Stress is good, stress is bad. Um, this multi-level response is good or bad. Uh, that's all hogwash. I mean, the truth is, is that our brain and our immune system have been communicating for millions of years before we were around, right? right? It's a tightly well-calibrated, well-integrated system that 
is that's pr its primary purpose is exactly what you uh, alluded to to keep the to keep the body safe from uh, microbial, social, and physical threats. Mm -hmm. Why? To increase likelihood of reproductive success and survival. Yeah. So if you if somebody was coming at you a threatening conspecific that looks pretty angry. Can and you specify what a conspecific is? I've seen that in a lot of your work. But do you mind? One somebody who's like you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So for a tiger, it's going to be. Am I threatening? A, uh, yeah, is that what you no, mean? you're I, very, I, you're okay. very nice. Okay. <laughs> so far, yeah. my brain is. Uh, no, I mean for a tiger, it's another tiger. For me, it would be you. Okay. Right. So of the same kind, and. Uh, uh, when, when the situation goes from being friendly and supportive to being potentially dangerous, then it makes sense for your body to shift its motivational stance, but also this immune component in order to be best prepared for physical wounding if it occurs. Yeah. And so these, the benefits and the costs, I mean, if you're in a threatening situation, of course you want some hypervigilance, right? Right. If you didn't, you may miss out on a threat that was there that you didn't catch. Yeah. Um, the pain sensitivity, of course, if your body is injured in some way, then you need to be hypersensitive to that so that you know, you're taking proper precautions, et cetera. Uh, and as I said, you know, that's, gonna, that's gonna change your whole behavioral repertoire toward fight or flight, depending on you know, what, which one is gonna be more adaptive right. again. But the long-term costs, that's the downside of all that, right? right? And I think probably the, the viewers here can see, like, how you would get to the long-term costs, yeah. right? Let's say, t t to simplify, two pathways, right? First of all, your actual social environment is bad, and it doesn't change. Yeah. So, you know, you live in a threatening neighborhood. Uh, you have, you know, your a, a, a child who... Um, uh, who, who's getting a lot of threatening messages from, uh, from parents or from caregivers, uh, or you know, you're very lonely or shy and you seclude a lot and you don't have a lot of friends or don't feel really embedded in a social network. So that's one pathway, I mean, it's social, actual social environment. But as I said, you can, there's this huge role of perception, right? So you can even be, you can be well advantaged, have lots of friends, but just never feel connected. Right. Or you, you may have great friends, but you always feel evaluated. Yeah. And so that's the other way in which you're going to get to this um, switch from sort of short-term benefits to long-term costs, depending on the actual environment, but more importantly, how you're appraising it. Yeah, I think, and I want to just drive that home, that you don't have to be getting chased by a tiger, or at least I feel like this system was established in that context. Right. In the, Absolutely. In, like we're talking uh, on the sort of evolutionary basis for why this is present. And that is, you know, it, it didn't develop in the context of like social media or our current present day social context. Right. It developed when we were getting chased by tigers and, you know, so on and so forth, where these things would be beneficial and ideally not happening all the time. Right. But now, you know, living in the context that we are now, right, when we're sort of in a completely different social context, whether that is, you know, you're constantly having um, uh, perceptions of your social context from your phone and, you know, how you're processing that in your brain, you know, that can lead to these systems being online all the time. Yeah, and the social evaluative component of those, um, of, of our current... Um, context is so huge like you mentioned i mean uh kids nowadays are uh, regular users of at least one if not multiple uh social media platforms mm -hmm. which are which if you think about it is just totally wild these um i mean all of us are in this world but kids especially who uh who grew up with it and don't you know they weren't around before Facebook was around, right? That's like the current generation. Right. So um, uh, there's this other virtual reality out there that is, that is not, it is virtual, but it is very real for them. And that all involves people presenting uh, their best selves 
in some cases, it, you know, fabricated self, uh, but certainly, if not fabricated, highly curated. Um, and, uh, and that becomes a reference point for, uh, for how we feel and think about our own lives, yeah. whether or not we like it or not. So yeah. I had a professor who said, you know, I, I moved uh, 39 times before I graduated from high school. We grew up dirt poor in the Bronx. We had nothing and we were happy as hell. Why? I mean, there were no TVs. Ever, you know, your reference point was your group of friends who all had approximately as much as you did. Right. You're present focused, you're mindful, you know, and of, of course you come home, you, you wish you had more, but, um, but, that, but that having that reference point of something that is everybody else is like you and you're connected and all in it together is very different than what we have now. Yeah. And then also another point, and you kind of mentioned it earlier, but that I found really interesting is sort of this, what, what you call and what I've heard called the anticipatory effect, yes. right? Meaning this system isn't reactive necessarily, right? It's also, it also has like an anticipatory component to it, right? When it's going to anticipate a level of threat. That's right. right. Via like the smallest trigger potentially, right? Or... Um, how you perceive how you perceive someone's facial expression, right? And you know whether that's an appropriate perception or not, right? This system doesn't care, right? If you're perceiving it as threatening, right? This system is going online and contributing to that inflammation. Yeah, two important points you say there. One is that it, again, it's all about the perception. So, viewers, let's get that straight, right? right. Um, but the second one is the anticipatory nature of it. And what I would say is that having a really good prediction system that can activate in an, an anticipatory threat response that, that increases inflammation in anticipation of a potential social threat becoming a physical threat should have been highly conserved. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that the, the earlier on you could detect those threats and reduce your risk, the more likely you would have been to survive, to survive yeah. and to pass on your genes, et cetera. So, yeah. uh, so those of us who developed an acute ability to read social cues, uh, to understand when a, a situation, a social situation starts to go sour, but then also to bring it back to a friendly place where we can maintain social relationships, that's highly conserved, right. the ability to cooperate, especially with people who are like us. Um, but also when we can't recover those situations and keep them uh, friendly, the ability to detect that change in circumstances early on and then mount an inflammatory response to that, which gets these immune cells in all compartments of the body as early as possible so that if the body is wounded in some way, those cells are already in, in that compartment. Right. And, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but the, this is an issue, right? This persistence of this system and of this sort of inflammation um, secondary to these perceptions and whatnot is an issue because it certainly has an effect on our health, on our brain health, even on our mortality, right? Um, so... Let's start with, you know, logically speaking. There's a lot to unpack there. Uh, there's a lot to unpack <laughs> there, and, we, and we'll, try, we'll try our best to do so. But um, I think, you know, logically speaking, it's like um, there's ways that this system can be online all the time, right? And the logical way, it's like uh, if you're in a constantly stressful situation, right? right? Like an externally stressful situation, like, you know, come to mind like a, a domestic violence situation where you're just in that situation. Or you're a corrections like, officer. You're, or you're a corrections officer, right? That makes sense. Yep. Um, but then there's also this idea that you've talked about before regarding the social safety schema. I love it. Do you want to extrapolate a little bit I on love that? it. Uh, again, I, we all live secondary immunology, so I just want us to all think about our childhoods for a moment and uh, think about the types of messages that your parents or your caregivers 
uh, said to you uh, when you were, uh, you know, packing your lunch and, and going off to school, or you know, when you uh, when you came, you know, crying or upset to a parent uh, because of something that a friend said. In those moments, how did what did your parents say? How did they help you make meaning out of the social world? For example, did they say? Uh, you know, friendships are always difficult, but, uh, but it's the most important thing you'll find in life, and, uh, and we all go through arguments every once in a while, but you just need to lean in, you know, and repair that friend, not repair, I wouldn't say repair to an eight-year-old, but, right. you know, uh, go and make it better, and, you know, yeah, they, you know, this is your best friend we're talking about, right? You're going to be best friends forever. Mm -hmm. You know, best friendships are a beautiful thing. I mean, what, do, what does that tell a, you know, the growing human mind right. developing this um, understanding framework or social schema, kind of this cognitive representation of the world? Uh, or, you know, you have your first breakup, right? What, what did your parents say when you came home and you're like in tatters because your boyfriend or a girlfriend broke up with you? Did they say, you know, I'm so sorry, did they provide... Uh, uh, social warmth, or did you get this opposite, that's sort of more negative, right? There's no such thing as love. Uh, you know, I told you not to be in a relationship with that person because other people are just going to take advantage of you. Right. Um, you better, you know, you better get it together because this is just going to be the first of many. Uh, you look at your father, you know, look how he treats me. Like, what did you expect anything different? Mm kind of messages, sure. right? And other messages about people in general. For example, uh, you, you know, remember when you're walking home, you know, please take Franklin Avenue, don't go the other way because, you know, that's not the good neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You know, it's oftentimes these, me sometimes these messages can be directly negative right. to influence how we think about the world, like, there's no such thing as love. You're never going to fall in love. Right. Look at what happened to me. Right. But, but other times, they're seemingly well-meaning, but amb sufficiently ambiguous, such as to be interpreted as negative. Right. Like, when you walk home, make sure you don't go that way. Right. Well, it's like, what the hell does that mean? You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, obviously, some implication of there are safe neighborhoods and dangerous neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to say, like, if that's exactly true then yeah, you better avoid that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But these other things about like, does love exist? Are people um, helpful or hurtful? Are other individuals uh, dependable or undependable? Um, uh, all of these um, ways of understanding the world, I think, our first experience of all of that and the way that we make sense of it is through the meaning and messages we get from our parents and caregivers. And so... That was a long-winded answer. That was but a fantastic social answer. Social schemas, that was awesome. I think, is the intentioned but also the unintentional ways in which the adults and the messages around us um, create our realities. Right. And, yeah. and, how, and specifically, not just realities in general, but how we view ourselves in a social context with other people and also this kind of neighborhood, community, and world level of, of whether or not the world is a friendly, benevolent place that is going to support our growth or whether or not the other people in, in, in the world is a, is a dangerous place where we always need to look out for um, potential harm. Yeah. And, you know, certainly the, uh, this sort of transgenerational passing down of prior experiences and prior trauma, right, can be related to what you're talking about, right? Where like a parent's experience or whatever sort of trauma happened in their past you know, they're basing their recommendations and what they're telling their child based off of those experiences. And I think there might be like a genetic component to it too, certainly. But I think that, you know, this might play into it as well. Yeah, I have a thousand examples of that. I mean, you know, when we're, you know, when you're driving to school and you have your parents driving you to school, it's like, you know, you got that 15, 20, 30 minutes where you're just like talking about the world, you know. Right, right. And even during that sliver of life, which, you know, you're in school until you can drive yourself. It's like, you know, your parents, at least my dad, you know, 
you, my dad or my mom is, you know, the, you're talking about the world, about the day, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And yeah. about how it's going. Yeah. It's a huge opportunity to shape kids' minds. And those conversations that happen um, can, I think, have a huge impact. And you see your parents' behavior, you see the behavior around the people around you. And we've all been next to people who are really anxious. Right. What happens? I mean, we become anxious ourselves, right? right? And that, right. that part, I think, also, it's not rocket science. You know, yeah. I mean, we are trying to understand the world as quickly as possible. We're trying to calibrate ourselves to the likely risks in the environment. And we rely on, you know, the older individuals around us uh, primarily to, to understand that. And, yeah. then our, and then our peers. Yeah. So let's bring it back to uh, inflammation yeah. in this system. How, how does that experience, how does that child's experience then lead to um, issues with this system? Got it. So we can talk about what's the good side, right? You're in a social interaction with somebody who you think is friendly, but then all of a sudden they become very aggressive. Your brain indicates to the immune system that I don't know how it's, this is going to go, but there's a potential for wounding here. Right. Brain signals the immune system to release um, uh, immune cells, which then release prone, these pro-inflammatory cytokines, these small proteins that drive um, uh, the inflammatory response to different compartments in the body. Why? Because, you know, if you're going to likely to be cut on your arm, then that wound healing, that accelerated wound healing as a result of your immunologic response is going to be more effective if those cells are already there when you're wounded, mm -hmm. right? So potential for something to go south, at that early indication, your body is mobilizing immune cells to all compartments of the body. That means that if, some, if you get a cut on your arm or you know, as a result of a fight or something like that, then those immune cells are already in those compartments. Right. So that's everything about the adaptive advantage, right? Those, that inflammatory response aids in recovery, accelerates um, wound healing. The downside on the right, um, some of these uh, effects of a result of inflammation are um, what are called sickness behaviors. Mm -hmm. So there are classic sickness behaviors like um, huge changes in eat and sleep. Um, also, uh, social behavioral withdrawal, feeling general malaise. Mm -hmm. These classic sickness behaviors are driven by the inflammatory response. And that's some of the things that you see here. Um, depression, for example, anhedonia, or the loss of, loss of interest or pleasure. Um, the other long-term costs are essentially um, secondary effects to inflammation. So if you have sufficient inflammation for a long enough period of time, that starts to damage cells. Uh, other proteins in the body, other cells in the body that are responsible for you know, numerous functions. So let's take the brain, for example. You need neurons to fire and wire properly in order for functional cognition. Mm -hmm. And to the extent to which those neurons and other cells in the brain are damaged by inflammation, you are going to degrade the ability for those neurons to fire and wire together in a fully functional, adaptive way. Mm -hmm. And that damage is caused by inflammation-induced oxidative stress, mm -hmm. which, as I said, damages, damages the functional capacity of all cells in the body. And then I think what happens is that you have a population of cells in any given organ, so let's say the heart or the brain, and there is some threshold at which um, that system can continue to function normally given the amount of oxidative damage that has occurred. Mm -hmm. So let's say, I don't know, if we turn that into an age cutoff, let's say it's like 40, 40, 45, 50, 55, you haven't yet accumulated enough uh, oxidative stress in those systems, and therefore those systems can still operate properly. Right. But at some point, let's say there's this hypothetical tipping point mm. at which that stress-induced chronic inflammation has now caused sufficient damage, oxidative damage to those um, 
um, to, the, to the cells that, op that are in those organ systems to which you've now changed the way in which those systems can function. Yeah. And, and that, that's a stress model, but of course, you can have a, a traumatic injury model right. where those changes in the brain, for example, happen in a, in a minute, right. in a second. Right. And, you know, bringing it back to the social schema theory, right? Yep. It's like if you're always taught growing up to be vigilant and um, you're brought up in a context where, you know, you're, you're being told, you know, these people are threatening, this is threatening, that's threatening, and you're always on edge, right? And therefore, this system is always active, right? Um, and you're constantly being put in situations where this system is online, then, you know, you're constantly in sort of an inflammatory state, right? And what you're saying, it's, hey, that's quote unquote fine, right? From a, like a, a, a brain basis until you get to that tipping point where, you know, you've had enough inflammation for enough time that these neural circuits and these neurons, you know, start being significantly affected to then affect behavior, that's right? right yeah. And then the manifestation of that behavior are some of these long-term costs and sickness, um, I, I forget what sickness you, behaviors, sickness yep. behaviors that, you, that you referred to, uh, one of which was depression. Yeah. Is that about right? That's about right. Uh, like I said, you, you're taking my job. So yeah. I think the, um, I use an example of, you know, let's say you have an event. Today is what, Tuesday? So let's say you have a crappy boss. You know, you're supposed to meet with that boss at 3 p.m. on Friday. Some of us won't think about that interaction and how it's going to go before 2.55 on Friday. Mm -hmm. That means that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning, Friday afternoon, those individuals are in the moment. They're not living that um, anticipatory threat for all four of those days. Others of us, uh, for, for better and also for worse, are um, ruminating about the different ways in which that conversation could go sour, the things that the boss might say to us, uh, even their facial expression. And you can already understand how those two people are going to have very different immunological lives. Right. Right? Yeah. The first person is going to be, you know, there's no threat engagement, all other things being equal, no threat, threat engagement of the immune system. Right. Right? Because there's no, you're not perceiving any... The other person right now has imagined, has symbolically represented this socially threatening interaction in their mind on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? That's four additional days of pro-inflammatory events. Right. By the way, that had no functional purpose. Mm -hmm. There's a small functional purpose in terms of being able to anticipate what your boss might do so that you can react properly. But that doesn't require four days of preparation. And let's all be honest, we're not preparing right. when we're doing that. Yeah. We're not like trying to play out right. what we're going to say. Right, right. Mostly it's just stewing ruminating. and yeah. ruminating yeah. and the negativeness of it all. So that's what I mean by no functional purpose. We're essentially symbolically representing a threatening environment in the absence of a threatening environment. Yeah. I do want to give a quick nod to adverse childhood experiences. And you do a lot of work with adverse childhood experiences, obviously, clearly, because it plays into this uh, social schema sort That's of right. idea, right? Um, and adverse childhood experiences have been shown to lead to adverse mental health outcomes. And a lot of it is like right along that timeline that you're talking about, right? Which it's like an adverse childhood experience, obviously in childhood, um, indicates a potential adverse mental health outcome as an adult. And we should define those. So adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are things like divorce, which mm -hmm. obviously is common, um, uh, and, uh, but also abuse, neglect, maltreatment, right. um, mental, severe mental health problems in the house. So yeah, that's the thing, right, is that our thinking about the world is not disjointed from the, from the actual world. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the additional level of complexity becomes, is that way of thinking about the world still adaptive? Yeah. Uh, adverse childhood experiences, by definition, occur before age 18. That's mm. just how they're defined. Yeah. And then we have to say, you know, if, if, um, if you did have 
an ace or, or multiple aces early on, is that still informative for your current circumstance? Right, as an adult. As an adult. Right. And I think when we think about whether or not this whole multi-level response is adaptive versus mul uh, maladaptive, that's what it comes down to, right? Yeah. Your brain and your immune system are doing its damnedest to calibrate itself to what it believes is the actual reality. Mm -hmm. So if you grew up in a threatening reality and you're still there, then that functioning is going to have a lot of collateral damage, but it may still serve its functional Beneficial. purpose. Yeah. Oftentimes, that's not the case, right? Oftentimes, you develop uh, social safety schemas or an understanding of the world that you then carry in to your current relationships, even though that reality is not particularly true. I gave the example of love. If you have one breakup because it didn't go well, who knows, by the way, why that breakup even occurred, but right. whatever. You know, now we're going to extrapolate that to all other relationships forever yeah. in your lifetime. Yeah. That doesn't make sense, yeah, right? Yeah, what right. you can, we all meet good people and bad people, and it certainly doesn't have implications for other folks in our life. So, so the system is made to be adaptive, but that's when the adaptiveness breaks down is when we, you know, in our mind's eye, carry those schemas through to our adulthood, regardless of whether it's adaptive for the situation or yeah. not. Yeah. And then what about, you've also written a little bit about belonging. And I think it's like, it's such an important concept nowadays, right? Where we're seeing like all this polarization between the entire population, right? Where, and, and this descent that I've been seeing into like tribalism, you know, with everything going on. Um, and then there's people, certainly tribalism doesn't seem like it's too great of a thing. It's probably like, you know, an evolutionary concept that benefited us in the past, blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, when, when tribes occur, there's people that are, that get stuck in the middle, right? And that, don't have a sense of belonging. You know, I moved around a lot. You mentioned the, I think your professor that moved around a lot. <clears throat> you know, maybe I had a, a, a issue with belonging because of how much I moved, I moved around. Um, can you speak a little bit about how belonging can contribute to um, this sort of, you know, inflammatory state being online all the time? Yeah, I love it. And thank you. Uh, for bringing that up and also, f you know, we're, we're recording here on election day 2022. So uh, the tribalism uh, feeling, I think, is alive and well in all of our <laughs> genomes yeah. today. Yeah. Um, belonging. So first thing, belonging uh, can be social belonging. It is social belonging, but it does. It's not just social belonging. You can also um, belong to a place, which may sound funny in America because America hasn't been around for a long time, but, right. uh, this, what I mean for that is, you know, there are places other than the United States that have been around for longer where you have generations who lived and worked and went to school in that same, literally that same place mm -hmm. with the same buildings, with the same neighbors, with the same community for hundreds and hundreds of years. Right. We don't have that so much in the United States, a little bit more transitory, but that belonging to place also I think is something that, um, that we don't give enough credit to and that also intersects in a lot of interesting ways with social belonging. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, think of whether or not you feel really at home in your work environment the building that you work in, uh, you know, I don't know much about the science of built environments, but I do know that a lot of businesses have moved to this kind of, you know, drop station workflow yeah. or, you know, all of the offices, none of the offices have windows. So they're all like in the middle of the building. And then like the common spaces are like facing out to the windows. Mm -hmm. Right now, interestingly enough, those built environments have been shown to, create, foster a lot of social interaction. But oddly enough, it gives people a really crappy office that they don't feel good about. Right. And if they even have an office at all. So I think of like, what does it mean to like belong to the space where you work or where you spend 40 hours a week? Do you feel like you have permanence and ongoing connection to that physical space 
to the ideals and to the people around you. Mm. I used just a silly example of an office space, but you know, if you're with a company for 10, 15, 20 years and you don't have your own office, that may affect whether or not you feel as though you really belong and you have a sense of permanence and continuity and predictability. Right. And since we're talking about threat biology here, being able to feel like you belong, as if you belong, and that there's a permanence and a predictability to the situation enables you to not require this threat biology. Right. Because you're embedded, you're connected, and the situation is predictable. Yeah. You're, nobody's going to come and say, you no longer work here, yeah, or that's yeah. no longer your office, or whatever it is. And right. we, you know, I just use the office example also because mental health happens at the office as well. A lot right. of us live our daily lives in an office. But of course, neighborhood and community, right? We can think of what it means to belong to a place, to a community that has a tight-knit social fabric, um, where we feel like if we fall, the people around us will, will rally and build us up again. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do, you know, in terms of like whether or not it's activating these pathways, as I said, the, the predictability, the permanence of the environment, the sense that there's continuity and that that situation is safe and inclusive is really important. Yeah, I think another thing that I wanted to make sure that we hit on is the contribution of obesity to either this system or a state of you know chronic inflammation. Yep. Um, you know, especially the visceral adipose tissue. Can you extrapolate a little bit on you know, what that is and how that contributes to either this system or chronic states of inflammation? Yeah, adipose tissue is tummy fat, so yeah. we all got it. Yeah. It's not Thanksgiving yet, but we'll right. all get a little bit more pretty soon. And uh, immune cells hang out in their storehouses throughout the body. Mm -hmm bone marrow, spleen, and adipose tissue. And uh, so adipose tissue is a main storehouse for, um, for immune cells, and therefore uh, the more adipose tissue you have, the greater storehouse you have potentially for these immune cells that could get distributed when you're stressed out. Mm -hmm. So having too much tummy fat can also, of course, you know, reduce... Um, the likelihood that you're going to engage in exercise or be physically active. So, mm. you know, more tummy fat can contribute to more tummy fat. It's sort of, you get in this recursive loop, but, but the other thing that you're talking about is really important. So when you're stressed out, if you have more adipose tissue, there's a, you have a greater inflammatory potential. Mm -hmm. So the thinking goes more adipose tissue, greater storehouse of immune cells. When you're stressed out, and your immune system mobilizes and does that anticipatory uh, inflammatory response to potential social threat, you're releasing more immune cells and then potentially more pro-inflammatory cytokines throughout the body, which is then ramping up inflammation to a greater degree. Right. So the way to think about it, um, if this thinking is correct, is that adipose tissue is, it basically confirm, confers inflammatory potential under stress. And so then, the more lean you are, the less inflammatory potential you have as opposed to somebody who is less lean. And, that, and the, the duration of that inflammation, because we're talking here about inflammation being present for an extended period of time, right? Now, does that also confer the duration of that inflammation after that stress response or just the sheer number of immune cells that are released? I love it. I don't know the answer, but I think this is... You know, these, um, the calibration of that system and how quickly, specifically, the inflammatory response comes back down to baseline is what we should all care about. Right. Because we've already gotten that off the table that, like, the response itself is not bad. Right. If we didn't have that multi-level response, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't be around. Right. So it's not about the response. It's all about the time course after. Yeah. So I don't let know me, the answer let, to that. Let me, pull, and, let me pull up a slide. I'm sorry. Yeah. Remember, but let me pull up a slide. I brought these slides. I might as well use I them, love right? It. Yeah. Um, Let's flip. So I think this is a, uh, I, I also got this from one, one of the papers you published, but um, it's just a relation between cortisol and then cytokines. Cytokines we talked about are those proteins that promote inflammation that usually get released, not usually, but do get released by, you know, these immune cells. 
And, you know, maybe you can walk us through that. But, you know, my understanding is you have that threat, right? Cortisol goes up, goes, goes back down, but then you have sort of the persistence of these pro-inflammatory uh, pro cytokines in your system after that threat during that recovery time period. Is that about right? Yeah, that's right. So you, um, cortisol is, is the most anti-inflammatory substance in the body. So if you don't have, if you don't have this persistent experience of threat, then what could happen here is that you have this initial HPA access activity that leads to the release of cortisol. And, um, and if you don't have any physical wounding in your body, then the cortisol can uh, ramp down mm -hmm. um, you know, cytokine activity in, mm -hmm. in all throughout the body. Uh, but exactly what you said, if you have the experience of persistent threat or, uh, or if you have um, all actual ongoing persistent threat or if you have physical wounding in the body, then this is what's going to happen, we, we think. Mm -hmm. You're going to have an increase in cortisol and HPA, HPA axis activity in response to the actual threat, but it's not going to be sufficient for down-regulating the inflammatory response. The cortisol isn't going to be sufficient. That's to right. Down and, <clears throat> and there are mechanisms for why we think that happens also. And, you know, we talked about the um, obesity. Is there a um, decreased sensitivity to cortisol due to obesity that you've noticed will then not decrease the pro-inflammatory cytokine levels? I have no doubt that a hundred listeners will know the answer to that, <laughs> which I don't know. They can comment below. They will please comment below. Please comment and, below and tell if you us, know the answer. Please like and subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what I do know is that there is a mechanism uh, that um, called glucocorticoid resistance, mm -hmm. which can account for this occurring. Right. And that essentially means that you have immune cells with these antennas on them, receptors, and glucocorticoid resistance, in essence, is some kind of desensitization of those antennas to the anti-inflammatory signal of cortisol. Right. And there are different theories for mechanistically what glucocorticoid resistance looks like. So one possibility is that the receptors recede. So you have an immune, immune cell that's pumping out cytokines and cortisol is telling that immune cell to shut off, but the receptor is receded and therefore the immune cell doesn't get that anti-inflammatory signal. Right. Another possibility is that it has nothing to do with receptor signaling, it has to do with something, some complex transcription factor interactions inside the cytoplasm or the nucleus of the cell, whereby right. The receptors are getting the anti-inflammatory message, but then some guy, you know, some transcription factor is like drinking its coffee and he's like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pick up the phone and tell the nucleus of the cell to like, you know, I'm making a joke here, but it's like, there's right. a breakdown in signal right. because of desensitization at some level. Right. And so, um, glucocorticoid insensitivity or glucocorticoid resistance basically means that you have cortisol splashing these immune cells for a long period of time and the function has changed such that those immune cells no longer hear uh, that anti-inflammatory signal. Right. And, that's and that's where you can get this combination of chronically elevated cortisol levels combined with chronically elevated inflammatory levels. Mm. That's very interesting. What about diet? We talked about it uh, very quickly earlier before we started recording, um, and I do want to give a nod to diet. So certainly a leaky gut is something that can contribute to inflammation. Um, certain foods themselves, right, in the context of a leaky gut can, con can contribute to systemic inflammation. Yeah. And we talked about those highways before, right, that are direct highways between your system and the brain, right? So certainly that systemic inflammation can, you know, get yep. into the brain and, and alter brain physiology and, and behavior. Yeah. What I love about the immune system at, so I should just say we are, 
all of us living today are very unlikely, thankfully, to die from communicable diseases, mm -hmm. unlike our ancestors 150, 200, 300 years ago. Uh, most of us will die from chronic diseases of aging, you know, that are driven by inflammation. Mm. And that sounds so grim <laughs> when you put it that way. Right. But let me tell you the upside, which is that there are all of these levers that we can pull, or inputs, if you want to think of them that way, that can change, that can change immune system function. Mm -hmm. So we talked about stress, now we're on to diet, but also sleep, exercise, chemical exposure. Yeah. I think we have a slide on, on those things. Yeah. If we focus on diet, we've known for a long time that there are diets that are more pro-inflammatory and diets that are anti-inflammatory. Right. Should we? Um, uh, we know that there are diets that are more pro-inflammatory and diets that are more anti-inflammatory. So, you know, the, the pro-inflammatory diets are going to, uh, are going to increase our basal or baseline inflammatory activity, mm -hmm. which interestingly enough, to the extent to which, for example, we have a leaky gut, we're now inducing a systemic inflammatory response. Mm -hmm that is going to also be able to communicate with our central nervous system to influence how we perceive social relationships. Right. Can you extrapolate that on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which I think is fascinating yeah, yeah. too, right? So we talked a lot about the top-down regulation. So like if you, where our conversation started was that you have these perceptions of the world, you have these socially safe or socially, safe or socially threatening schemas, and our perception of social interactions is influencing our inflammatory activity top down. Mm -hmm. But the opposite is also true. Right. So you gave the example of a leaky gut. Now you're inducing inflammation all throughout the periphery as a function of bacterial products being released into the open air of the, of the rest right. of your body where they don't belong, yeah. right? It should stay in the gut. So now you're inducing this systemic inflammatory response that can, can signal the central nervous system that there's a threat present in the body. Got it. How? By the pathways you know, that we mentioned. Potentially these meningeal lymphatic vessels, mm -hmm. if they're bidirectional, which, I, which it seems like they are, which enables immune products in the periphery of the body to traffic to the central nervous system as a function of this a, what I call cytokine superhighway. So there's a right. physical structure that can potentially connect uh, inflammation that's occurring in the body with the central nervous system. Right. Uh, but also the vagus nerve, which we've known about for a long time, uh, is constantly communicating in a very fast-paced way um, physiological information about the periphery back to the central nervous system. Let me, let me go to that. Let me go back to that slide because yeah. I think that slide is really going to illustrate that really well. So you're talking about the vagus nerve, right? And it's not only, you know, where the vagus nerve is providing input into like your immune system, but what you're saying is there's also the sort of uh, the vice versa effect or the opposite effect, right? Where an immune system that is act or immune cell that is active will signal to the vagus nerve system, uh, to the vagus nerve, which will then input into your brain and then potentially alter a brain state or maybe even a, a brain behavior. Absolutely. And I think the, the, the same is for the sympathetic nervous system, right? Yeah, you're seeing it here. I mean, the efferent vagus, you know, which what you were talking about before, the uh, efferent vagus is innervating the heart, liver, gastrointestinal tract, right. you know, intestine, spleen, exactly like you said, but, but the opposite, which is that the afferent, afferent vagus nerve has, um, you know, the ability to detect inflammatory events and cytokines that are circulating in the periphery and very quickly, in a hot second, tell the brain that um, the immunologic state... Something's going on. Something's going on. Yeah. That's interesting. It has to, right? Think about it. it like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's... it's and then you have the, uh, the meningeal lymphatic vessels, right, that connect with your entire system, right? So, you know, even if you don't have, you know, you're not considering the vagus or any of these other systems, certainly your immune cells can enter your brain through these meningeal lymphatic vessels. That's right. Yeah. 
crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, and like I said, you know, if you don't believe it, go and eat a crappy diet for a day or a week and you'll see how motivated you feel. Right. But the, th but the thing is, it's, it's, there's, there's not that connection between the immune system and how you're feeling. Right. I think, you know, I don't know when you eat Thanksgiving, you're talking about Thanksgiving, right? When you have a big Thanksgiving dinner and you just feel uh, really crappy, it's <laughs> like, well, this is like the, I don't even know, the tryptophan or something like yeah. that, some, some release. It's like, no, it's probably more, might be related to this. I'm not, I won't say it is or it isn't. I'm just saying we now know enough about these multi-level mechanisms to completely make sense out of why it is that events, uh, that are happening in the periphery change our mood, our mindset, our behavior, our disease risk, et cetera. Amazing. So let's, uh, so we talked about, I think we laid a pretty good foundation <laughs> Great. for this whole thing. I want to get into specific diseases, PTSD. Okay. Right? I think that's a low hanging fruit, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, how can this system, whether the inflammatory system, um, or this system, which is intimately involved, um, how is it involved in post-traumatic stress disorder, would you say? That, uh, you know, individuals with PTSD, uh, they have a tough time mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons. I mean, the hypervigilance and um, the exaggerated threat response, the startle response mm -hmm. uh, can be debilitating, you know, and for some individuals doesn't go away, you know, the startle in and of itself, like hearing a car backfire or something, you know, you think about all the times in your life where there's a loud sound around, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, if you have an exaggerated threat or startle response, you know, you're constantly put back into that space um, where you're feeling immediately threatened right. because of that. So that, you know, that it can be debilitating. Um, there's also, you know, you have a lot of chronic disease risk in PTSD, yeah. which I think to your point is, you know, like what's at the heart of that. And, uh, Something, so I'm not a neuroscientist by training, but it's very interesting work on the neurobiology of PTSD, whereby you have this, you know, confluence of events, high salience, very high threat, sometimes threat to life. Uh, and you have this neurological event which instantiates that uh, threatening experience into the brain in a way that has much more permanence than other experiences normally would have. Mm -hmm. And again, somebody, you know, in this audience will know the neurobiology of that much better than me. Mm -hmm. But that instantiation of that memory leads to this high salience of that situation going forward in a way that uh, predominates the person's experience of the world right. and also their, their experience of the world, but also their physiological basal physiological activity, mm -hmm. right? For some individuals with PTSD, they never feel relaxed. Right. They always feel on edge. Right. That, ex that acute experience of threat or threat to life or whatever caused the, the PTSD, whatever the traumatic event was, becomes a new reality for their physiological system. Right. Uh, and we don't have to go back from the beginning, but we can see how this model, this the social safety theory model here, would account for the long-term health impacts that are seen from individuals with PTSD, right? You have this acute traumatic event that gets instantiated in the brain that changes the person's perceptions, but also their physiological set point in a way that's driving sympathetic arousal. Right. And sympathetic arousal, as we see it on the left, is a key driver of the inflammatory response. So you're shifting, you're up, up regulating that basal inflammatory response for individuals who are constantly perceiving the world like that. And those, to the extent to which you have greater basal inflammatory activity, feeding back to the central nervous system on the, in terms of the amount of threat that is, excuse me, that those cytokines are inducing a th threat reality, a threat response right. um, in neurons. And then um, there's evidence to show that people with PTSD 
have increased levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines in their system. Yes, and right? also in anxiety disorders and also in depression right. as well. Uh, I've seen evidence also in schizophrenia. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, we probably won't get too much into therapeutics, but that's where my mind goes because yeah. let's take depression, for example. SSRI treatment's been around for a long time, billions of dollars spent there, and yet... SSRIs work well for, let's say, 30 to 35% of people on a good day. Right. So now you start thinking about immunotherapies and other ways in to these mental health problems, but also physical health disorders that might involve modulation of the immune system. And, and this, I'm not going to go there, but I would love I'm probably going to go there in a little good, bit. Don't okay. worry about it. Um, I'll listen. <laughs> but And then also the mortality risk for people with... You know, in the circumstance we can use PTSD as sort of, you know, an example of people with mental health disorders. Um, people with PTSD have, I think, increased rate of all-cause mortality relative to people without PTSD. I think it was like 16% versus, versus, uh, with P, uh, for people with PTSD versus, I think, 10% with people without PTSD. So certainly, you know, this chronic inflammatory state that it's like so difficult to treat and get out of, right, isn't only causing people to lose sleep and, and, and their functional status deteriorating, but then in addition to that, it's potentially shortening their lives. Yeah, and I, and I suspect, I don't know the data, but I suspect that if you look at inflammation-related cause, uh, causes of mortality as well, you would see that even an even, even stronger link. Yeah. Um, I mean, before COVID, uh, 9 out of 10 leading causes of death in the United States today were attributable in part to stress-related biology. Yeah. So then COVID took over, but, you know, I would suspect that there's a strong, <laughs> there's certainly a strong immunological component in, you know, in response to the coronavirus. Right. Um, but being stressed out is, uh, and having corona is, you know, I'm sure is going to reduce functional capacity yeah. quite a bit. So, you know, we, even with Corona, we, we still may be that, you know, nine out of 10 causes of death are attributable in part to, you know, stress biology. If it's, if it's not, if it's not in the cause of the disease itself, it certainly can be in the exacerbation of the disease or in the metastasis of the disease. And cancers are a great example where still in 2022, we don't have super convincing evidence that stress biology can cause the initiation of a tumor. Right. But we have great evidence that stress biology can accelerate tumor growth um, through angiogenesis or the introduction of capillaries uh, into tumors to provide those tumors with all of the nutrients they need to grow. But also that stress biology can cause... Um, metastasis of those cancers to other compartments in the body. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, that can make all of the difference in terms of mortality risk. Right. Absolutely. Um, what about um, neurodegenerative conditions, right? So talking about brain health, we covered mental health a little bit. Um, what about dementias? So certainly um, it seems like there's a lot of evidence out there for inflammation contributing to um, neurodegeneration, which ends up leading behaviorally and symptomatically to dementia, whether that's Alzheimer's dementia, Parkinson's disease, dementia, and obviously personally biased, not biased, but personally interested because of um, the chronic traumatic encephalopathy dementia, right? People that have uh, repetitive head injuries, um, you know, and have subsequent a lot of uh, behavioral uh, issues associated with that, mental health issues associated with that. Um, do you think that there is pretty good evidence for this sort of chronic systemic inflammation contributing to some of these diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's? Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, the, the folks in charge of billing codes won't like this, but listen, brain health is mental health is health. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, if you don't, you know, you can't have health without brain health. Right. Cause your brain is in. Is, your brain is in charge of your body. Right. <laughs> it's the main control center. Uh, your brain is certainly in charge of your mental health. So these distinctions, also where our conversation started, are, are compl you know, complete hoopla. Yeah. Um, 
it's it's all it's it's all connected physiologically yeah. and you know i'm i don't study neurodegenerative disorders but if i had to model it in one second what i would say is that uh you have uh proper neuronal growth and connectivity throughout the course of your life and uh you then at some point in your life have deterioration of the functional capacity of of neurons yeah. And as we just uh, pointed to quickly, that can happen as a result of an acute traumatic brain injury, you know, or concu bad concussion or something, to, or, or, uh, or it can happen slowly over time as a result of lots of insults over the course of a, a day, a week, a year, or an entire football career. Right. And, um, and so those can be physical insults, the brain rattling around in the skull, causing neuroinflammatory events that increase oxidative stress and damage cells, uh, which then damage the functional capacity of those cells to do their primary job. Uh, and in the case of neurons, uh, what I suspect happens is that the more oxidative stress you have, the less functional capacity those neurons are going to have to communicate and, and operate as a well-connected, well-functioning system to do its intended function. Right. And when you have that oxi sufficient oxidative stress, I suppose what's happening is, uh, is that you're breaking down the ability for those, um, those systems to um, operate so as to give rise to proper attention, proper memory, and also proper coordination between different brain systems that um, are that need to happen in order for us to have a coherent um, sense of self and yeah. a sense of our personal history, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. So I and also you know I've what I've noticed and you know we take care of a lot of the military veterans, concomitant traumatic brain injury and PTSD. Um, I've noticed, I think when, when I was researching a little bit, I found that, you know, one study reported that veterans with a diagnosis of PTSD had a cumulative incidence rate of 10.6% for dementia, uh, while those without PTSD had a rate of 6.6. .6. So it seems like, you know, PTSD might be a predisposing factor for dementia and is this sort of chronic inflammatory state a potential contributor, you know? Yeah, how could it, given what we know about the neurobiology of inflammation, I mean, we talk about a lot about inflammation in the periphery, but, you know, there's, there's a lot to know about uh, the neuroinflammatory response, which is just contained within the brain, right? You can have a, a concussion, a brain insult that is, that is primarily becomes a neuroinflammatory event just in the central nervous system. Right. And we've um, seen persistent um, systemic inflammation in patients that are still having symptoms after their concussion when they should have resolved. Yeah, and now I gave lot. you the now I gave you the pathways you, yeah, you for gave, why, yeah. why that's going to happen, right? I'm so, going to show all of my patients this. So you have uh, you have several pathways by which that can happen, and you know, like I said, when you have a um, a physical event like a traumatic brain injury that kicks kickstarts this huge inflammatory event in the body, you always have the potential for that inflammatory state to become self-promoting mm -hmm. through this sort of feedback loops, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a neuroinflammatory event, huge release of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the central nervous system. They can then get trafficked to the periphery of the body, which can cause other systemic changes in immunologic sensitivity which can then feed back to the central nervous system to continue, continue this perception of threat right. um, uh, in the brain. And what's also interesting is, uh, is that the, the types of immune, the, the sensitivity of immune cells to other cytokines changes depending on the physiological state under which those immune cells are born. Mm. So immune cells that are born during a, sy a systemic inflammatory situation are more sensitive 
to pro-inflammatory cytokines then are immune cells that are born de novo right. under non-inflammatory circumstances. Yeah. So just think about that for a second. So let's say you've been really stressed out for two months. All of the immune cells that are born during that time period are potentially more sensitive. They're hypersensitive to uh, in, in pro-inflammatory signals than are immune cells that would have been born while you were on that two-week meditation retreat. Yeah. Speaking of, um, let's talk about some interventions to not only mitigate stress, but then also Great. these sort of effects, right? Um, let's start with therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Um, I think people think, and you know, I used to think before, um, you know, re doing a little bit of research that, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy kind of just restructures the way that, you know, you perceive whatever issue that it is that you're going through. Right. Yep. But I think you found that cognitive behavioral therapy can actually decrease or actually be, have a beneficial immune system function. Is that right? Yeah, well, it, that's not an either or. So we did this in meta-analysis a few years ago, appeared in JAMA Psychiatry, so great journal. Mm -hmm. We looked at all the studies um, that, uh, that did some intervention, psychosocial intervention, mm -hmm. like you said, like cognitive behavior therapy, for example, but also assessed pre and post changes in immune system function. Mm -hmm. And CBT, um, and also CBT done in a group context, uh, leads to improvements in, in a lot of immune system markers, most prominently reductions in pro-inflammatory cytokines. So yeah. you do an R well-controlled RCT, uh, you assess inflammation before and inflammation after, and you see huge reductions in, in inflammation as a result of traditional cognitive behavior therapy and also group-based cognitive behavioral therapy. And the reason why I said it's not either or is that the mechanism of that could be twofold. In CBT, you have behavioral targets. Uh, so when you're stressed out, behavior goes wacky. You know, your sleep goes awry. You're not sleeping properly uh, or your sleep is disrupted. Or you normally exercise and you stop exercising. Both of those things, sleep and physical activity, can be pro-inflammatory. So CBT could be reducing inflammation through behavioral pathways. Yeah. Uh, but also what you mentioned through the through the neuro neurocognitive pathway, right? Mm -hmm. You have a lot of negative automatic thoughts, which you know are things like "I'm not good enough," uh, "This is not going well," "I'm going to fail," "I'm a complete failure," "This is never going to get better," "There's no such thing as love," "This person hates me," "This person doesn't like me," right. um, "I'm going to get fired." Uh, of course, a lot of those negative automatic thoughts are quite extravagant sometimes, right? Yeah. Uh, not very justifiable. And so through this purpose, through this process of cognitive restructuring, you're getting individuals to, let's say, treat those thoughts as a scientist would. Right. You know, okay, you, you think that you're never going to find love. Let's look at the evidence for that, the evidence against that, and then let's, quote unquote, rewrite that thought into a, a more balanced thought, right. which, of course, the more extreme it is, the less likely it is to be true. And so that, you know, what you're trying to do is essentially reframe people's lives for them, rewrite their thoughts, especially the negative automatic thoughts, which are driving this downstream threat biology in the absence of actual threat. Right. And from this system, what you're, I mean, in the layman's terms, you're basically dubbing down all those exaggerated responses from all these systems, secondary to those continuous thoughts that they're having that, you know, might not be necessarily very rational. Or exactly. Very and if accurate. you're in CBT for a good CBT trial, then a good CBT therapist will start with the negative automatic thoughts that pop up in the moment, like right. here when I'm talking to you. But then what you get into, you know, like session 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, is where those thoughts are coming from. Right. The negative core beliefs. Yeah. Right. What are your really long-standing trait-like beliefs about yourself, others in the future that give rise to negative automatic thoughts. And when you can modify those negative core beliefs, then you can really see persistent benefit. So yeah. like the person who thinks that they're not good enough yeah, and they've believed that since they were young right. and all of the negative thoughts that they have, not all of them, but the negative thoughts they have during the course of a day can all be, you know, 
linked back right, to that thought yeah. that they're not. So when you change, when you deal at that deep level of core beliefs and you can rewrite somebody's core belief from I'm not good enough to something more positive and balanced and health and joy promoting, right. then you can have an enormous impact yeah. on, uh, on these systems we're talking about. Here. Yeah. And then what do you, what do you think about mindfulness? I, I, I've seen that you did a little bit of work on mindfulness, um, which is a little bit different kind of psychotherapy, right? It's different. Yeah. And probably you'll get comments for people. You even call it a psychotherapy. Of course, people, other people Am would say, get mind, well, no, I that? mean, you can go in and you can do <laughs> mindfulness with a therapist, but you know, people would also say it's a way of living. And, um, what, you know, I think that there are different, um, there are different, uh, mindfulness and CBT are probably helpful for different reasons. So mm. CBT is a, is primarily changing behaviors. Let's, let's call them pro-inflammatory behaviors mm -hmm. or thoughts. Yeah. And and making those more beneficial and health supporting. Mindfulness, uh, the way that I think about it is sort of harkens back to that example where I said you have a nasty boss, you're going to have a conversation at 3 p.m. on Friday, but yeah. it's only Tuesday at noon. The mindful individual is going to be in the moment and they're not going to be in that meeting right. from Tuesday, Constantly. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Right. So interestingly enough, we, we don't, pr thankfully present day, we're not often in a current threatening situation, Yeah. but the non mindful mind is always going to, um, go to that future event that could be potentially threatening or that past event that didn't go well. Right. Yeah. So the mind, what mindfulness does is, you know, in a non-judgmental way, bring that focus back to the moment, right. which, by the way, is non-threatening. Yeah. So I, it's beneficial for a lot of reasons, but in terms of ramping down threat biology, I think it does that at least in part because it's gently bringing the mind back to the present where you're having a great conversation with an awesome person who you just met, not thinking about that negative thing that could potentially happen in the future or something that happened in the past, which is unchangeable. Yeah. Uh, it's probably not accurate, but I've, I've, I've heard of it thought anxiety and depression. Anxiety is you're, you're constantly thinking about the future. Depression is constantly thinking about the past. Certainly a very simplistic way of thinking about it. But, um, I think that's you're hundred percent right. That's how mindfulness can work. And well, one of the biggest risk moment. factors for your first depressive episode is a history of anxiety. For your first depressive episode of the history, of and I also saw that uh, a stressful event is one of the biggest risk factors, a uh, major stressful event is, a, is yep. a risk factor for depression. Um, what about exercise? 50% of American adults are considered <laughs> physically inactive. Is that it? That was it. I That's think back pretty in like good. 2017 would or 2014. would not be surprised if it was higher. I'm sure it's higher. Um, there, oddly enough, exercise is pro inflammatory, uh, but in a way that's very different from uh, the immunodynamics that uh, are set in place by stress. So what, what appears to be useful about exercise in terms of what we're talking about here is that the brain and the immune system has to be maximally calibrated such that the inflammatory response is time limited. So mm -hmm. what you want is sort of a highly flexible quickly responsive inflammatory response that comes on when you need it and goes away when you don't need it. Yep. And one of the things that we think exercise does is it gives that neural immune interaction practice, mm -hmm. which I just think is so fascinating. Yeah, it's awesome. So think about like the next time when you're hitting the treadmill and you're like, what I'm doing right now is I'm like giving my brain and my immune system an opportunity to become more tightly calibrated. Right. You're, it's like immune system training, right? I, who thinks about this? No that, one I've thinks never about hopped that. on the treadmill and said, let's go brain and immune system. Like now we're going to, we're going to get gonna tightly up. coupled. Right. So the next time I'm stressed, right. you'll be, you'll be more well calibrated to, to ramp down that inflammatory response the minute the stressor ends. Right. So there are other pathways like 
if you exercise more, you're going to have less adipose tissue, so you're going to have less of an inflammatory potential, which we already talked about. Right. But I'm super fascinated about this tight calibration between the brain and immune system that occurs partly as a result of frequent exercise. Right. And there's another fascinating example of that, which is microbial environment. I, you know, I had you that, were going to go there. I had, no, I had it on the topic outline, but I know we're, we're running a little short on time, so I was like, I got to skip that. Though it's really, really interesting. I got to say it. You can't get skip into it. it, please. So there's really interesting research out there uh, about the education of the immune system as a function of early microbial environment. Right. So what the hell does that mean? Let's take it, let's simplify it, right? If you grow up on a farm, you're going to be exposed to different microbial products than if you grew up in an urban environment. Right. If you grew up on a farm, you have animals around you, you have dirt, you have mud, mm -hmm. you have plants everywhere. Yeah. If you grow up in Westwood, <laughs> uh, you're not going to have a lot of cows roaming right. around. Right. Uh, those microbial factors, it turns out, is absolutely critical for educating the immune system about the types of pathogens and other microbial products that it might be exposed to later. Mm -hmm. Some interesting studies about the functional implications of having a well-educated immune system. In one study, individuals who grew up in a rural environment versus an urban environment came into the lab and were stressed out as a result of this social stressor, like mm -hmm. you're asked to give a public speaking, uh, public speaking task about why you'd be a good job candidate. Well, right. it turns out that the individuals who grew up in the rural environment found it more stressful. Right. Let's say it's probably less likely, less like what they would have experienced growing up. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. But their immune systems responded much better. Much less inflammation okay. in the individuals who grew up in the rural environment versus the urban environment. Very interesting. So there's a little bit, so now we add another layer of sophistication onto what we were talking about earlier. I said it's all about appraisals. It, it is a lot about appraisals, but there's also something about how well educated your immune system was growing up as a result of environmental exposures mm -hmm. and how well tightly calibrated it is with your um, uh, with your central nervous system. Yeah, that's such an excellent example. And then obviously, like you said, that plays into exercise too because you're able to do something about that, right? Like you're able to um, cre create a dynamic immune system as an adult, right? It's like you're not beholden you can. to... You that's right. You're not right. beholden to you know, your childhood experiences or you know, whether you grew up in, in an urban setting or a farm. That's right? right. With exercise, you can potentially... You know, that's an intervention that you have autonomy over that you can do yourself. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, and you mentioned it before. What about, so we talk about inflammation and we have a lot of medications that are anti-inflammatory, right? Um, acetaminophen, Tylenol is one of them, right? Um, do you foresee that, you know, anti-inflammatory agents like Tylenol or, you know, even like steroids can decrease inflammation and potentially decrease um you know, the results of the systemic inflammation, whether that's on brain health or overall health? So I don't know if you're setting me up because we did a study on that, but I, we did, I, I mentioned Tylenol because I saw that. you. Yeah. So did we did this, we did this study where we, um, you know, we randomly assigned some individuals to take Tylenol for 21 days. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and monitored their daily experiences of, uh, what we called social pain, yeah. you know, essentially the, um, uh, your experience of the quality of your social relationships. Right. And uh, you see huge reductions in the experience of daily social pain as a function of taking Tylenol, especially if you're highly forgiving. If you're forgiving of incidences that happened in a social context. Exactly. Does Tylenol make you more forgiving? Or is it just um, two things that you know are separate but potentially uh, can synergistically contribute to you know, decrease inflammation and decrease well, you have to pain. believe you would have to believe as though they're interactions, right? Like if you're so Tylenol, of course, is directly turning down the volume of pain signaling in the brain. Right. But imagine you're in a really uh, heated argument and that signal is off. 
right. I'm probably going to be able to get through it and forgive you more easily right. than if that pain signaling, that social pain, physical pain signaling, is that like a nine or a 10? Right. Your listeners who experience chronic pain will know that well. You know, it's really can be difficult or impossible to hold space for a contentious conversation when you're feeling pain in your body. It's hard to do anything. So I would say probably what you indicated is, is, is true that if you're taking neuro neural pain signaling from a nine or a 10 down to a one or a two, you're going to open up space in your mind to deal with a lot of things that are very difficult to do when you're, you know, when you're in a lot of pain. But the concept of social pain, though, is like such an interesting concept to me, right? Because you always think about Tylenol and a lot of these other things that we give that are anti-inflammatory for quote unquote organic. You might yep. hate, you might hate that term. I kind of hate it too, but, <laughs> um, but like, or, you know, where you're decreasing inflammation and therefore your pain is going to improve, but you're saying there's also this other kind of pain, that social pain that can also maybe be addressed by some of these anti-inflammatory factors. Yeah, and that came out of great work done in our lab and other individuals at UCLA, which showed that if you put somebody in an fMRI scanner and you expose them to physical pain, like you put a heat pad on their leg, then you have uh, systems in the brain that are reliably engaged as a result of physical pain. But if you put somebody in the fMRI scanner and you make them believe as though they're being socially rejected, guess what? You have engagement of several of the same, same systems. And so um, it, so that's fascinating. It also helps us to explain our lived experience of why we say things like, you broke my heart, and why we, right. use, um, uh, why we use physical pain words to describe social relationships that are tumultuous or that um, uh, or they're not, not very friendly, you right, know? Right. And... Uh, And the other way to think about it is that inflammation is the body's primary response to uh, to physical insults. Right. Right. So but we also know now that inflammation rises in the context of socially tumultuous situations. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a common neurobiology underlying both physical and social pain. But since we see increases in inflammation under both contexts, and the brain is a critical linchpin that is both appraising the social environment and also regulating inflammation, Mm -hmm. we start to have some picture that this is all linked in one way or another. Right. And I really want to hit this. You've, I don't know if you coined the term. It's a very cool term. (laughs) But, you know, nonetheless, behavioral psychedelics. I did coin it. You, you coined it. I was okay. really worried you're going to throw something. You're like, psychoneurimnology. <laughs> no, behavioral psychedelics. I came across that. Um, and I mean, like, psychedelics are exploding, right? For, like, mental health, even brain injury, right? And like you've mentioned, there's been billions of dollars um, and, uh, you know, put into SSRIs and some other treatments for mental health, particularly PTSD, And, you know, isn't very efficacious, but then here comes along, you know, the, not Advent, but maybe re-Advent of psychedelics as a therapy for these kind of things. And it seems to be exploding. Um, How does that play into sort of this framework that we've been talking about? I'm glad you bring it up for a few reasons. And first of all, because um, getting to therapeutics has to be what this work is all about. Right. We have too much human suffering now to just be doing this research, I don't know, for learning. Right. I mean, the learning is good, but if we're not doing it in the service of reducing suffering or getting to better therapeutics, then we're wasting a, a lot of money and a lot of time. Right. And um, I'm not a psychedelic researcher, so I've, I come at this from the outside. But what I've noticed is that... Um, And it's the same thing with other potential therapies where those therapies have a life in a community on their own, which doesn't always, um, the goals may not be the same as what's required for the level of rigor that we would want of our medical grade therapies. So mindfulness meditation is an example 
whereby the scientific community has tried to study mindfulness, but a lot of the mindfulness trials are not really that great. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen in the psychedelic space is the same thing. There are a couple of randomized control trials that have come out that are better, but we're right now in this place where we don't have great um, RCTs for psychedelic, psychedelic or psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, which is the combination of psychedelics and in and a psychotherapeutic yeah. environment or context. Um, and those randomized control trials are not really well done. But there's another part to this behavioral psychedelics um, is that what's the purpose, what's the actual purpose of inducing um, that experience through a psychedelic compound? We have a lot of chronic diseases that are chronic diseases of thinking and behavior, which we've talked about, like eating poorly and not exercising or carrying trauma in your brain and your body because you've been doing it for a long time and it's very different, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to change everything about the way that you think about the world quickly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and these, we view these disorders as being in great part a disorder of, um, of rigid behavior and rigid thinking. Right. And so long story short, behavioral psychedelics has in it the goal of not just studying these interactions between psychedelics and mind and behavior in a more controlled scientific fashion, but also just the basic notion of saying modifying human behavior has to be a goal of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy because if you're not changing those rigid behaviors that are driving chronic disease risk then you're missing a huge opportunity to reduce um uh mortality that's attributable yeah. to those chronic diseases and, and you you talked about it back in uh, when we we're talking about cbt which it's you know by session 12 10 or 12 right you're really dealing with the core issue right but that's cbt without psychedelic therapy you know, could psychedelic therapy, you know, be a shortcut so that you don't have to get to session 10 or 12 to be able to do that, but rather you're doing it by like session one or two and restructuring. In, in you know? full disclosure, I haven't participated in a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, but I know a lot of people who have. And, uh, and again, this is not scientific, but what they invariably tell me is that they have, they have trauma experiences they have been holding on to this um, uh, this trauma in their brain and their body for years, mm -hmm. and they've tried everything and nothing's worked. They tried a good trial of psychedelic psychotherapy, and they feel like they're in somebody else's body now. Yeah, they feel like they're in the body that they remember before the trauma occurred. Yeah, I've heard I've heard that too plenty. And so you know, probably what's happening there is the psychedelic compounds are. Uh, are inducing uh, a, 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 um, a state of neurocognitive flexibility yeah. that they cannot self-induce, right. no matter how much CBT they've gone through. Right, yeah, that's a great point. And uh, anyways, SSRIs don't do that, don't do 100%. That. And I don't think any other mental health treatments that we have, any other compounds we have, do that either. Right. So that's the upside potential is basically to provide a, um, an opportunity to reset the brain and the immune system, uh, even in individuals who have a high trauma exposure or who have experienced ACEs. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's back on the scene. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Um, I also want to make sure that we hit the, this last topic, I know we're short on time, but I, I, I want to make sure we hit it because it's important. Resiliency, you know, is resiliency just, you know, all these things that we talked about, you know, the, the exercise, the sort of your social contacts, um, is it a matter of just sort of optimizing your social contacts and all these other scenarios that would contribute to this system being online all the time? and the resultant systemic inflammation, or is it something a little bit more inherent than that? 
I think resiliency has to be all of the things we talked about. Mm. You know, a, what a resilient community is a community that stands up for other individuals who are being rejected, excluded, devalued. A resilient family is, you know, a family where when somebody comes home and they've had a bad day at school, it's all about social warmth and hugs and doubling down on the, the person's belief that they're loved and that the world is a good place and mm -hmm. that they'll get through it and that they have the capacity to grow from it. Um, resilience in our bodies has to do with the mindset that we bring to challenging circumstances and whether or not we view those difficult circumstances as an opportunity to fail or as an opportunity to practice something that we've been working on for a long period of time to get better at. Um, and it's also this physiological resilience that we alluded to, right? It's about educating our immune systems and giving our brains and our immune systems as much opportunity as possible to become well calibrated through exercise. Mm -hmm. It's about eating well. <laughs> let, uh, me, let me bring up this slide yep. again, because I brought slides up. This slide. Yep. Right? So this is, yeah. you know, this is all about resilience. Um, of course, limited infections when you can, staying physically active so that you're reducing your adipose tissue, but also so that you're giving your brain and your immune system opportunities to communicate. Um, diet, obviously, you know, the Western diet's not the best for us. So, don't, don't self-induce inflammatory events right. if you can avoid it. Right. We, did, we have not talked about sleep, but I have to say that sleep, lack of sleep is just as inflammatory as smoking. And sleep problems are huge. And for those of us who have sleep problems, uh, it's very hard to focus on other things if you have a lack of sleep. Right. If you're not sleeping well throughout the night, that means that you have a lot of sympathetic arousal and a lack of parasympathetic arousal, and that combination is gonna drive inflammation. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever had a crappy night's sleep and you wake up feeling anxious, that's psychoneuroimmunology, baby. <laughs> that's a result yeah. of a lack of sleep driving sympathetic nerv nervous system arousal, which is driving inflammation, which when you wake up is driving hypervigilance and anxious thoughts. Right, yeah. That's why I said all these levers, right? If you don't want to work on your sleep, that's fine. Go work on your diet. You don't want to work on your diet, that's fine. Go work on your physical activity. There's such you an know, Ideally, you work on all of them, and right. that's the beauty of the immune system. Right. There's such interplay between all of them, though. Like with my PTSD patients, they have disturbed sleep, isolation, chronic stress. Um, you know, a lot of them are physically inactive, right? So there's like so much interplay between all these different things that, you know, is contributed to by PTSD and there's sort of this positive feedback loop between all these different things and as well as their uh, PTSD symptoms. And we didn't talk about xenobiotics either. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think uh, you're going to have to come back. And so Let's we can, do it. so we can talk about some more stuff. Um, but I do want to ask one more thing. You know, we talk about, you know, resiliency is sort of, you know, optimizing all these things that can contribute to systemic, um, uh, chronic inflammation, but what about those people? You know, when I when I said that it, is it inherent, I was sort of referring to what about you know some children that come from like you know terrible backgrounds, right? That have tons of adverse childhood experiences, but then somehow they just make it out and you know they become you know extremely successful people. Um, however, you would define that, right? They live uh, completely happy lives. Um, you know, certainly maybe they optimized all these things, but is there something inherent about them? And, you know, we didn't talk about genetics. Genetics certainly has a significant component to this. But, you know, is it genetics? Is it something else? What do you think? Well, listen, I think we all do the best that we can do, and that's the best we can do. Yeah. And hopefully by the time you kick the bucket, you got better at living your full potential. Yeah. And I think that's the that's that's the best that all of us can do. Right. Now, uh, some people don't like to know that the power to live a better life is in their hands yeah. because that is an, it's an enormous amount of responsibility. Now, I tell you, there are all of these things that you can do 
to be happier, to be more joyful than how you are today. But it's hard to get the motivation to do that. So now you're like, am I going to meet that challenge right. and rewrite my life? Right. That's, that's hard. But, uh, but you can do it. And your past is not your destiny. And there is all, you can always take control over what you can take control of. Right. That piece of the pie. Right. The genetics piece on a good day is 30 to 35% of the destiny we're talking about here. Mm. What does that mean? That means we got 60, 65, maybe 70% of our life course that variability in our outcomes that we do control. And that's all I want to say. You can't, can't change the 30 to 35% that's instantiated in our DNA. But brothers and sisters, we got the other 60 to 70% that we can control if we're willing to, um, yeah, change these gears. Yeah. I, I love what you're doing. I think that's a fantastic place to end. I love what you're doing. I love the idea of the sort of systemic inflammation as being, you know, sort of this common factor in a lot of the suffering that we see out there, whether that's, you know, mental health, some of these other diseases like, you know, the neurodegenerative diseases like, um, you know, Alzheimer's dementia and whatnot. I think what you're doing is absolutely incredible. I feel honored and humbled to have sat across from you and just to have this conversation. Thank you so much for coming. Is there anything else that you want to promote um, some of the work that you're doing, some of the projects that you're on? I know you're on some multi-million dollar <laughs> grants. I don't know if you want to promote those, um, but is there anything else that you want to... You Just talk? to let people know that if you're living in California these days, you're in a good place that cares a lot about stress, uh, trauma, and resilience. Uh, we recently put together a network on that topic called the California Stress, Trauma, and Resilience Network. You can learn more about it at calstarnetwork.org. Uh, if you're interested in the science of it, you can go to our lab website, uclastresslab.org, and, uh, and download any of the papers that we've talked about here including the paper on social safety theory and behavioral psychedelics and a bunch of others. And, uh, and all else I would say is, you know, go on and be good to yourself and kind to yourself and, and kind to others and, you know, like subscribe, retweet and, and share. Sounds amazing. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. George Slavich. Thank you so much for joining. Um, there'll be an email at the bottom of the video description. If you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, Shoot them that way, and maybe I can be the middleman, and I'll forward them on to you. And you Shoot can, them my you know, way. I'll, I'll connect everybody. All right, everyone, that does it. That concludes the stress and resiliency episode on the UCLA Brain Sport Podcast. Get out there. Get out Change there. your life. Change your life. You Sleep can better. do it. Sleep better. You got Exercise it. and everything else that we talked about. But most importantly, stay safe. Be well. Thanks.